Yo, what up? It's Roger from Masquerilla, introducing you to your favorite emerging artist since 2009. Today, we have our first ever podcast episode, and we're here with Nothing Nowhere. What's up? What up, Roger? What up, internet? <laughs> What's going on? What are you up to on this trip in LA? Dude, I'm here to do Masquerilla and Masquerilla only. So you flew in the private jet? I flew in the private jet. I, I brought two, okay? I brought one. I brought another one to just follow me. And uh, long story short, we landed in your driveway and we're here. So Yes, we're actually recording this in my home, by the way. This is the most least clout podcast in Los Angeles. But it's a beautiful space, I got to say. Wow, thank you. And we have our shoes off right now. Yep, we're living it. It's real comfortable. <laughs> okay, so let's take it back to before you had two private jets. Okay. Where are you from? Yeah, so I grew up uh, in a town called Foxborough, Massachusetts, and like, there's like, there's nothing going on in Foxborough. The only thing that it's known for is uh, like the Patriot Stadium, is there, right. and that's it. Um, grew up, went to school there, uh, skated, hung out with friends. It's pretty like naturey area. It's like some really cool like reservoirs and like some cool woodsy stuff and uh. Yeah, I just grew up going around all around New England. Like, uh, my family's had a house in Vermont my whole life, too. So, just New England, just a New England guy. So, what was, like, high school in Massachusetts like for you? I feel like, is it as an intense place as people make it out to seem? I don't know, man. Dude, I feel like it's, like, it's, like, anywhere else. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it depends on where you are. Like, where I was, no. <laughs> like, there is... Yeah. There was not like maybe people would like get into like fights over like who had like the coolest like Sperry's or like <laughs> I don't, you know what I mean like I don't know it wasn't like it wasn't like a super rich place it wasn't like a bad place either like just depending on where you were but like there's some sketchy parts in like Boston and stuff but I feel like Massachusetts in general like for me growing up especially where it was like a big football town I felt kind of like damn this is like not my thing right. kind of thing yeah. but i was lucky to find like a group of like kids at the skate park who like shared my similar interests but like for the most part it wasn't really my thing you know what i mean so you weren't into sports at all in high school or anything like that no dude i tried lacrosse like for like a month and i realized i was terrible and i was like <laughs> i was I don't even know why I tried it in the first place. I thought it'd be like a cool thing to do. Like it would make me cool, but it that didn't make me cool. <laughs> you grew up in the in the East Coast too, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. actually from Long Beach, which is like okay. right near Queens, but it's, you know, it's technically on Long Island. I'm not yeah. going to lie to you. I'm from Long Island. But yeah, you know, very similar experience actually. Like all the cool kids played lacrosse and I played in like the seventh grade trying to fit in. And I was Same just thing, like right, dude? fucking around dude, and I used making to, like, jokes. Stand like next to the goal. I forget what I was. I was like attack or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. I used to stand next to the goalie, and like my goal, my like job was like to try and get goals. <laughs> so like I just stand there, and like I'd be like, oh shit! Like I see people running this way, and I'd be like, oh fuck! But and like I just didn't do anything. Just kind of like was like let it happen. So when you figured out that lacrosse wasn't your thing, yeah, what was the next step of your? high school life um i just kept skating like i've been making music and like heavily involved with music since i was 12 years old so like always like playing acoustic like posting songs on myspace and like uh you know like in little bands like pop punk bands hardcore bands i even was rapping when i was a little kid and wow. like just very heavily into music and like making like my own little films with friends just like skate videos and like skits and stuff so like really like was just doing that and then I got into high school and uh I met some really cool teachers and uh they kind of like helped foster my creativity and uh I would just kind of like not go to class and stay in the art wing and just like chill and like create stuff just like put stuff out so so I guess taking it back to when you're 12 and you're playing the guitar how exactly did you get into the guitar and music yeah so I have like you know like when you're younger you have like isolated memories like you really remember like mm -hmm. the one that i have uh it was was i have an older cousin dan and uh he had a guitar and he was really into it he put me onto like dashboard confessional and like the early november and stuff and uh i just remember um he used to let me play his guitar 
and I had no idea how to play it, but I'd just kind of strum it and be like, I really want to learn how to do that because it's like Dan was like the coolest person alive <laughs> to me, you know what I mean? And um, and then I went to a guitar lesson with my cousin Riley once, and uh, her instructor like played Crazy Train by Ozzy Osbourne, and I was like, I need to learn how to do that. <laughs> so uh, I started going to lessons uh, when I was 12, and uh started off just like, my instructor just taught me like Led Zeppelin and like Black Sabbath stuff and like stuff like that. Um, but I really got into it, man. A guitar was like all I ever wanted to do. I used to bring it into like school and my teacher would let me play it in recess and stuff. Really? And like, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. I used to like, I thought it was cool, but I used to uh, put like guitar like strings as shoelaces. Oh and stuff. my God. Yeah. I was. I was weird. You were a, a weird kid from a, a young age. Yeah, I was a weirdo. Yeah. So, okay. So, at what point did you start taking it more seriously? You play guitar from a young age. You're in high school. You're in bands. When did you, like, you know, figure it was something that you really wanted to pursue? I don't think that, like, I don't think I ever really considered it, like, wow, like, I'm going to, like, make a living out of it one day. Because it was, like, it's so... Not that, like, I think I had, like, so many teachers and stuff that were, like, you know, that's cool, but, like, why don't you try some, like, for a career, like, just have, a, like, a backup plan. Right, yeah. So that kind of, like, stuck with me for a bit, unfortunately. So, like, I never really took it seriously. I was just kind of, like, this is something, like, really fun. And uh, I, I knew, like, every day I wanted to play music. And uh, thankfully, I had, like, supportive parents that, like, we could play in the basement and stuff and have oh, band wow. practice. So. Um, I think like maybe when I was a junior in high school, like, you know, like 2010 or something like that, I like really kind of started like not taking it serious, but like giving it a, a bigger shot, you know what I mean? And trying to show more people. Um, so yeah. So what year was that? 2010? Yeah. 2010. Like Is that before SoundCloud? Like shit, man. I don't know. Yeah, me. I don't know. When the fuck did SoundCloud come out? We should know this. I know, right? You should We're, know this. I know. I'm supposedly like <laughs> I'm calling the, the cops, rap dude. guy. Yeah. But so, I mean, how were you getting your music out there then? Um, So I did like Pure Volume. Oh, fuck. And, uh, I completely forgot about that. Yeah, thing. Pure Volume. And, uh, you know, like MySpace too. But I was uploading music on MySpace in 2006 too. Whoa. So like... It was so, it was really bad, but I'll have to show you sometime. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, man. Um, yeah, probably like pure volume, I guess. Wait, hold on, hold on. So let's take it back. You're playing music in your parents' basement. Yeah. What were your parents doing at the time for work and like? Uh, my dad, so my dad, um, works with nonprofits. Like, uh, he does some really like, inspiring work like he works with learning center for the deaf uh another one called building educated leaders for life like pretty much he just like goes to nonprofits and like provides services for them so like shout out dad and uh, that's a cool my, uh, ass dad yeah have. yeah he's uh he does like a lot of good stuff for people so um and my mom you know on the other side does some really good stuff for people because she's a nurse so um yeah, they were, they'd come home from work or whatever, and I'd be, like, playing in the basement, like, loud as shit, and, like, they really put up with it, you know what I mean? I mean, sometimes I'd be up way too late playing and stuff, and, like, I'd have to get the hammer, but, like, <laughs> not literally, but like, they'd, they'd shut it down, but, uh, yeah. So, very supportive parents from your music early on. Yeah, for sure, um, which is, like... I don't take for granted like that's not everyone's parents are that supportive so I'm very lucky so were they like okay you're gonna go to college after or was there was there ever any thought of after high school you were thinking about I'm just gonna go pursue music or was it always I'm gonna go to college um I was a terrible student like my entire academic career like primarily because I didn't I didn't apply myself you know what I mean I just didn't care I was like, well, I just like playing music and funny enough, like I wanted to get a job in film because I felt like music was unrealistic or whatever that meant, (laughs) which is like, okay. 
Um, they're both like unrealistic if like you're a parent looking down, you know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah, they wanted me to go to college. I ended up going to college, uh, for film and, uh, kind of like lot, like stepped out of music for a little bit. And I remember being like really, really unfulfilled and like, you know, like pretty depressed. Uh, and then I got back in, when I got back into music was when I started Nothing Nowhere. Right. Um, so, I mean, like what was college like for you? So where'd you go to college? So I went to a college called Burlington College in Burlington, Vermont. It's actually not a college anymore because they want, they're they like millions of dollars in debt and it shut down. Did you like graduate from there? <clears throat> yeah. I did. So does your degree still count or it's like you don't Probably have not. <laughs> it's probably like if I ever <laughs> tried to apply for a job, they'd be like, Wait, this place you... didn't exist. Oh you're God, you're so insane. Funny. Um, so, yeah. So how many kids went there? literally like 250 is one of the smallest schools in the in the nation 250 kids holy shit yeah like i went to a small school and it's like i think like 2,000 kids or something where'd you go uh purchase purchase it's in new york if you're oh, okay there. it's yeah. like a small you know like liberal arts school in the suny system yeah where uh like dan deacon went if you're familiar with him that like producer dj guy nah. But yeah, like I always thought my college was small. It's like, damn, 250 kids. Like, what was college? Were there parties? Like, what were you doing in college? I definitely wasn't partying, no. Um, I, uh, same shit, like isolating myself in my room. And when I was trying music, I was just playing acoustic and, uh, fuck, dude, skating. Mm. Um, I had like two friends and we were really close, like Alex and Evan and Kyle, like I said, like three close friends. And, uh, yeah, we just like play Sega, maybe skate. And, uh, I don't know. I, I should have talked to more people when I was there, but I just, I don't know. But I think most people probably didn't even know I went there. They probably thought I was just some kid who showed up sometimes. That's so funny. Yeah. But it was cool. I mean... It was a very um, free college. There were, like, no grades. Like, you could choose to have grades if you wanted to. I feel like this is another reason why this college got shut down. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, is it, like, a state school? Like, what is it? Is it, like, a private? Yeah, it was, like, privately owned, yeah. So, what do you mean you choose if you want grades or not? You could do, like, kind of pass-fail, or you could do Uh, grades in, like... Very, like, crunchy granola, earthy, like, interesting school. Also, like, uh, walking around with no shoes on, as we currently have no shoes on right yeah, now. Yeah, I didn't have shoes on then. I don't have shoes on now. But, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I had some really good classes, like environmental science and stuff. And that was, was, like, the peak of my interest in nature and stuff was, like, that really solidified it for me. It was, like, so I got something out of it for sure. It wasn't like a way, a total waste. Yeah. Yeah. So you started Nothing Nowhere at college or was it after? Yeah, at college. It was okay. actually uh, the first song that I ever released as Nothing Nowhere. I mean, officially Nothing Nowhere was Don't Mind Me. And it was technically a project for my art history class. Whoa. My teacher was just kind of like, makes whatever you want. And I was coming back into music, um, feeling weird and like, I just was kind of like, fuck it. I want to make something that I like and I don't really care if anyone else likes it. Um, and there was that, there was that song and I just was like, I don't, no one's gonna like this or whatever. And I thankfully, I think like the next day I was like, I think some people like it. Wait, so, okay. So what happened? You put it by that point, you had a SoundCloud page. Yeah, I had a SoundCloud page, and actually, the actual Nothing Nowhere page, um, I had some acoustic stuff on there before I posted, like, the real mm, Nothing okay. Nowhere stuff, and I, and so I like, that So, like, you already had some followers built up already? You had, like, a Maybe, little like, 40. Yeah, oh, okay, 40. like, 40. It was not a fan base. It was probably just, like, people I knew. Yeah. Like, my sister. <laughs> so, so what, what does Nothing Nowhere mean? How do you come up with that name? Yeah, I was really into uh, Alan Watts. He's kind of like the philosopher, like lecturer. He had a lecture about nothing and like the fertileness of nothing and what what is the concept of nothing and how um, 
nothing is instrumental to something like you can't see your hand without the empty space around it and i just was really fascinated by the space between things like the space between here to the moon Mm. and uh i just would kind of go for hikes and think about like well what am i where am i going and uh i just came up with the name nothing nowhere and uh it just kind of like the impermanence of life and like I just, it also sounds cool to me. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, it sounds tight, but it also sounds nice like man. that's something that definitely being in Burlington and being at that school, that like really, I feel like it helped kind of shape not only the name, but I've, would you say like where you decided to take music of being in that environment? Yeah, yeah. I feel like it was like a liberating process for me because... I've been a musician for years, like literally since I was 12, like the majority of my life at this point, it seems. And um, it was a liberating process for me to start Nothing Nowhere because I was always so caught up in other people's expectations and what they would make of what I made. So I would always make my sound like catering to something else. Right. Um, Any band that I was in, I was like, well, I don't think people will like this, so I don't do that. And finally with like nothing nowhere i was like i need to do something that's fulfilling for me only and that's like therapeutic for me because i need to like put these emotions somewhere and uh thankfully i did that yeah so how are you like recording those early songs were those in your dorm room or was there a studio on campus or what was the process of even recording a lot of them were like in my like quote-unquote dorm uh with I was like living with a couple of dudes in Burlington and like just doing it in that room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean like what are we talking about? Early equipment, like MacBook. Yeah. Honestly, it's like the same stuff I use now. Oh, I just really? bought a couple more guitars. <laughs> yeah. I uh got my MacBook, Logic Pro X, a terrible interface. I think it's like a pre Sonus interface and uh just like a road mic yeah that's what i I just like did that and like realized that you didn't you know you don't need a lot of stuff to like make a cool song so what what year of college was it when you were doing that this is my last year at college oh so it was like the perfect timing of like you're coming into your own as an artist and you're about to leave school and be in the real world and yeah i was i was kind of in i had my foot in both i was uh doing an internship for video at the time that I that was cool but it wasn't really for me and uh I remember having a conversation with my dad like I I want to quit this like job and he was like well you work so hard just to get that job you want you want to quit it now and I think initially he was like really like bummed out about it but I I just like couldn't do it anymore I couldn't keep waking up and doing the nine to five thing when I wasn't in class and like uh-huh talking to people at the water bubbler and decorating my the cubicle water bubbler. What dude kind of massachusetts slang for water coolers is, is that, that what it like? is water cooler <laughs> water cooler so okay so then what happens you leave school and you go back home do you have like a part-time job while you're doing the music no so i was so yeah i uh i ended up getting a full-time job at that particular spot oh, it was shit. like a video editing firm and uh yeah, dude, it was like, it was interesting. I mean, I, I realized it wasn't for me and uh, I saved my money up. Like I saved like three grand up or whatever. And I eventually told him like, hey, like I think I'm going to bounce. And uh, I left that job and I recorded my first body of work as Nothing Nor as the Nothing Nor LP. And I started burning through that cash like buying groceries and stuff and then finally i put out some merch and people started buying merch and it was kind of like i took a sigh of relief like because there's some glimmer of hope with with music it's like it might just work out there's people who are willing to spend their money on what i'm doing dude yeah i I remember that so well it's like uh april 2015 and uh i just remember staying up like till seven or eight a.m just like 
making music and then like waking up at three and like not eating and like because i saw that first spark forever and and i never got any gratification or any feedback for any piece of music i ever made until then and i was like well i want to capitalize on it so like at that point how many followers did you have on soundcloud i think i was coming up on like a thousand and then like two thousand probably like up to like five thousand was like where it got um and it'd be, once i started seeing like the steady incline is like kind of like go time to just like keep making stuff so what were your parents supportive of it once they saw that you know you're making money you just left this job that you went to college for and then they see well you have these followers and you're making some sort of money did that kind of you know make them even more supportive than what they or what they already originally were. Yeah. I think like initially they were like a little confused, mm-hmm. like rightfully so. Um but I like I would like show like my dad a big like, look at this. Like someone just bought a shirt in Germany mm-hmm. and I used to just fill my car up with like shirts and go to the post office yeah. and ship them out and they they really started seeing it in uh they uh started they were like really supportive of it so it was cool so what was the next step after releasing that first project i don't know i think like i started talking to more people like oddly enough like the first people like who were bigger than me to ever show love was like the buffet boys like puya and mikey the magician especially like reached out and you know, like, they fucked with my stuff. And I started doing some more, like, collaborations and stuff like that. I released uh, a couple EPs, uh, Bummer and Who Are You. And, uh, yeah, I just, like, constantly was putting out music. Um, and I didn't really have, like, a goal in mind. I was like, well, something, something's going to happen at some point, you know. And it felt like it was happening, and I think it was. So, so at that point when you were, you know, releasing those EPs, were like labels are already hitting you up like what was that process like yeah i think maybe uh 2016 april of 2016 so like a year after Mm. um was when people really started hitting me up maybe a little bit before that like um february 2016 or something is i i got a bunch of phone calls because i think uh one of my songs i've been doing well was uh it was on the front page of Reddit hmm. and uh, these international booking agents found it at primary talent and they called me and then every day I'd wake up, I get a new phone call from someone and it was really wild. Uh, so like talent. at that point, did you have any sort of team around you or was no. it still just all you? Yeah, it was just me. And like, I didn't really know how to make sense of it. I was taking phone calls and like, I don't, I was like, I don't even know. And, uh, so thankfully my manager now reached out to me Yvonne and uh once I started working with her it's like she actually knew where to point me because it was mm. just like kind of chaos before then yeah so how was dealing with that process with I don't think you've actually touched on it yet in this specific interview but growing up you and now you deal with anxiety and other similar issues so actually let's just take it back can you yeah. touch on that a little bit? <clears throat> yeah. So um, I've had like really bad anxiety my whole life. It started when I was in second grade. And um, I think a lot of it has to do with genetics. So, like uh, just a lot of people in my family and oh, extended really? family that I have uh, anxiety. Because I don't really know why I have it. I just know I have it. And it got so bad where like I'd have to be sent home from school or like I'd have to leave class. And there was a special teacher aide with me. Whoa. Because I'd have panic attacks in school. And um, as I went into high school, uh, you know, I, they started coming back pretty bad. And, like, I remember having panic attacks and looking at my parents and disassociating and not even knowing who they were. Um, like, not even recognizing my own room. And uh, so it got it got really gnarly. And um, even today, like, I still have it, but I feel like music has been, like such a outlet for me 
and hearing from other people has like helped me a lot too like it's kind of like a double-edged sword like it helps me to write the music with my anxiety and i think it helps others listening to it um but you know it's something that i deal with today and like you know i take steps to make sure it's in check like i just got a new therapist like try and get outside stay active but i mean so growing up and you're being sent home from school what how did you deal with it as a child i didn't i didn't and i I didn't know like what was happening i didn't understand it i remember the nurse would send me home with packets of like you know like highlighter highlighter like you have like anxiety or whatever and like I really didn't know what it was. I just knew that there was this terrible feeling that like came upon me if I was just sitting in class and I'd start thinking that I was dying and like. But I mean, like, were your parents like, "Oh, hey, Joe, this is anxiety. We're going to take you to the doctor," or was it nobody knew what was going on? It sounds like. Um, I think my my mom's a nurse, thankfully. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, 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 and uh, yeah. she realized pretty early on, like, "Oh shit, like you have anxiety." And, you know, I remember, like, going to a therapist when I was, like, really young, mm, okay, um, okay. trying it out, and it's been a struggle ever ever since then, but uh, I feel like every day I have, like, more of a grasp on it, like, more of, like, an understanding on it, so. So, I guess, so then to fast forward to 2016, and you're getting all these phone calls, and your music is on the front page of Reddit, <laughs> how the hell did you deal with that? Yeah, man. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. It was kind of crazy. It was a mix. It was a little masked by ex- excitement at first, which was really awesome. But I think I had um, eventually, so like a little bit after that, in April of 2016, after I had started working with Yvonne and stuff, I was playing a showcase show in Brooklyn at Rough Trade. It was my first, mm-hmm. first kind of show, like real nothing nowhere show. And uh, it was just for a bunch of labels and like industry people. And I... Dude, and that was like the culmination of everything and really came back and, but at the same time, it's immersion therapy in a sense of like, you, I got thrown into the fire and I came out on the other side okay. And it's like really made me be able to deal with my anxiety better because I've thrown into these absurd situations now in my current life like that. Mm -hmm. Um where it's an interesting way of like treating anxiety so you link with your manager she's helping you put out your records at that point right yeah sort of just like putting it on like dsps like putting my stuff on spotify and stuff like that yeah so i feel like 2016 there was already this established kind of what i think people refer to as like an underground scene were you were you like ever a part of that when you first started recording music or were you even aware of it or I was a big fan of uh Sesh. I was a fan of uh, like Corbin and like the Standard and and them too. That was sort of my introduction into the like quote unquote underground. But in terms of like ever being a part of it i don't feel like i've ever i feel like i've always been on like the outside looking in in a weird way maybe that's just my own perspective like i feel like it's like this like get together at a house and i'm just like in the bushes outside just like what's up guys oh i you know i I, like put some thought into it i was trying to think about it but i don't know i think it is a little bit in your own head but i think it's also just I think typically people put their music on SoundCloud and then starts getting some traction and then they move to LA and then they're touring with some other like artist that's already in the scene. But just you, it's like a mix of you being in Vermont or mm-hmm. Massachusetts and then also, you know, your music is just also kind of sonically different, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, like I'm, I have a lot of self-awareness to realize that like what I make is like a different thing. I think... In a lot of ways, the only way, the only thing that we have in common, like sort of like the SoundCloud underground in in me is like we used SoundCloud as a vehicle to like progress our music and and to to share our sounds. Um, 
but it is interesting man yeah like mm-hmm. i do isolate myself from a lot of things i don't i don't come out to la or new york if i unless i absolutely have to you know what i mean and that is that because of your anxiety i think that might have a a, a piece to do with it yeah i also just like you know i'm kind of like a homebody and like i yeah. enjoy being up there and yeah because i remember you telling me one of like the first show shows you did outside of that um kind of showcase was you opened up for suicide boys suicide boys and puya how it was the that, that was the first show oh so yeah that was even before the showcase that was the show before the show So like what is that 2015 or is that 2016 fuck i don't know late 2015 early 2016 so like how does that work out is that like a local promoter hitting you up or Uh, how did that work i think it was just mikey the magician Mm -hmm. like yo do you want to like play on the boston date of uh was it the south side suicide tour is it that too that was too late no i think it must have been i i think that's the only tour they've done right so like yeah it was i had no idea what i was doing um showed up at the palladium in worcester mass and like just played some really sad songs <laughs> and uh were you like playing the guitar that yeah, early on too yeah yeah i always play guitar live usually but uh yeah some people fucked with it other people were very so, confused did you meet the suicide boys and puya and all them yeah great dudes yeah so like how'd that go like were they familiar with your music or i think so yeah like i i I don't really can't speak for them or whatever but i remember there was a little period of time where i would be talking to nick or something and just like sending him beats and stuff and uh just dumb shit that i made and then i remember meeting the suicide boys and like dude they were just like super nice i don't know it was just like so funny that that was the first like show so those early shows too that's when you were like wearing the hood and like kind of concealing your face on stage right yeah i'd say yeah like no one knew that i was even like a person before yeah right i don't know how we even touched on this yet so yeah you hid your face from your music for i mean up until really recently so i guess let's go back to the start of what was the thought process behind you not wanting anyone to know what you looked like? So I think like at first, like there's a lot of different angles to come at it. Um, some are like based on me, some are philosophical and some are just like coincidence. And like, I think when it first started out was like, I was posting songs onto SoundCloud and that was just like, okay, I'm posting my songs, you know what I mean? And and I'm putting my music out there because I'm a musician and hear my songs so you can hear my songs. And I just kept doing that and then and it never really occurred to me to like post a picture of myself because I was like, well, you want to hear my song, so that's what I do, I make songs. And and it never really occurred to me until like I made like, a, like an Instagram and I was kind of sitting there like, you don't put songs on Instagram, you know what I mean? And then... And it really, you know, started thinking about it. And I was like, well, why haven't I done this? Or maybe should I post a picture of myself? And um, the more I kind of thought about it, the more I thought it was like, you know, it was an interesting concept to like have the focal point be based around the music and not necessarily me as a person. Because, you know, I think like a lot of, I think more than ever, this is a total, total debatable, totally debatable. And it's my opinion, but like, I think music is heavily image based now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, whatever. Um, but I thought it would be an interesting angle to like put my songs out there without having people really need to know what I was like. And I feel like another angle of that would be like the whole anxiety thing too, because I also thought at the same time, I was like, well, what if people do know like who I am? There's, it was kind of like a comfort blanket, you know what I mean? It was like, if people, if I face any scrutiny or like any, anything really, it's like Joe, me, is separate from nothing, nowhere. Right, right. You couldn't really get to Joe. It was just nothing, nowhere. And, you know, 
the decision to sort of like come forward a little bit more and like I'm not I'm never gonna be like put myself out there out there but you know I'm not like hiding anymore I feel like that decision was kind of cemented when I went on tour and I had face-to-face -face conversations with kids who listen to my music and uh that's when I realized that like I'd had people tell me that like hey, your music like saved my life and uh, definitely don't take that lightly so I feel like in order to have like genuine relationships with them like I felt like that it might help them to dissolve that barrier that enigma that like shield that I put up and um because I want to be approachable and I want to like the ultimate goal for me like I swear to God with 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 nothing nowhere is just like to help people and I, what's the best way to help people? I feel like is to be personable and to be approachable and to have people look at me. And I realized that people might have saw themselves in me. So I feel like it was important to just kind of like let go and like maybe set an example that it's like, it was, this is another thing that I just had to get over. And I think like I'm still just like finally getting over it and putting myself out there. Yeah, because I remember even seeing you at the Los Angeles show and you were sound checking. I was getting close to doors and doors open and you were kind of just like hanging back towards the back of the venue and kids are walking in and I'm like looking at you. I'm like, like, do kids even know what he looks like yet? Or like, so what was that first step of revealing who you were? Was it, did you put a photo up or was it slowly doing more live shows and people seeing it on YouTube? Like, what was it? <clears throat> Yeah, I think, like, shows, mostly. Like, I wasn't really going to wear, like, a mask or anything. I'm just, like, not that guy. Because I saw you with the face paint in that music video. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. he's going to wear face paint nah, all the time, and it's going to be nah. fucking sick. Yeah. Nah. That would have been so tight, though. It would have been sick, man. I could have, like, been a juggalo or something. Yeah. Whatever. Maybe, hey, juggalos, hit me up. <laughs> I can um, do a cool collab. I'm not gonna lie to you. I would fucking do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> um, yeah, man. I think it was just like shows and like I'm realizing that like, well, people see what I look like every single day, and I'm and I like to go out after the show and just talk to people, like and listen to people, and uh, I think like I tried it too. It's funny, like I've tried it before, but even before then, like I think uh, Debbie Valentine. I showed my face in that video. Yeah, because, and, uh, because, okay, so how I found you was I was on SoundCloud and I was listening to, I forget who, it might have been someone like Puya or something like that. And then after their song was over, the next song that came up was something by Never Forever. And I was like, whoa, this is really good. What is this? And I did some research and I was like, oh, it's a side project of someone called Nothing Nowhere. And I looked... Up, nothing nowhere couldn't find anything about it but i found like one video where you're showing your face but there's there were no photos of anything anywhere else and i was so confused pretty intrigued i was like hmm what's going on here so like why was your face revealed in that video and you weren't really yeah so um i was talking to damon who is a starry right shout out to starry um we uh I was just like, man, I don't know what to do for this video. Cause like for all my videos, I just do like VHS montages or whatever. And I was like, and I was like, should I like show my face? And he was just like, yeah, man, fuck it. Just do it. And like, I did it. And then like the day after I was like, dude, we got to take this down, man. Like I can't do this. And then I realized like it already had plays and stuff. And I was like, fuck it. But like after that, I was like freaking out. Um, like, damn, like people are going to know what I look like. Like, people are gonna like i don't even know so i just i tried it out and then i was like no nah, we're, yeah, we're gonna it. keep it and then i came back around a little bit yeah and now i feel like you've went so far out that you can't possibly go back at this point right yeah like and that's like the same thing with like touring like it just comes back to touring like i'm right. playing in a different city to a ton of people every night like they know what i look like so I don't want to force it. I don't want it to be like a huge effort for me to like stay in the shadows. Like I just want to like, 
put out good music and like am i gonna post like full fit pics on instagram <laughs> no man like power to those who can do that or want to do that i'm just not that guy like maybe here and there i'll pop up but like i just want to put out good music okay so what is never forever yeah man i'm getting deep um so never forever is uh like I said earlier on the Nothing Nowhere SoundCloud, Nothing Nowhere was just acoustic songs when it first started, okay. like before anyone knew of Nothing Nowhere, it was 40 people. I took those down, took all those songs down and stuff. And uh, I had a, I started a separate account to like just upload uh, acoustic songs I made anywhere between like 2010 to like 2014. And that was like my spot where I just upload my old acoustic stuff or like whatever. So I don't know what the deal is with Never Forever. Maybe we'll see some more Never Forever. Maybe we won't. I don't know. So why those songs off SoundCloud? Because so, okay, so I mean, everyone knows, but if someone doesn't know, you put the songs on SoundCloud and then took them off, but someone re-uploaded them and you haven't made them take it down. So what's up with that whole process? <laughs> oh. Why are you letting them keep it up, but you took it off your page? Oh, uh, I don't know, man. I just, I, I had them, the, because you're talking about when I deleted them off Never Forever, right? Yeah. Because I, I had more on there, didn't I? Yeah, so yeah, now, you honestly, know, I probably just like was listening to them right after I uploaded them. I was like, these fucking suck. So I just took them down. Like it's like crazy that somebody already had them downloaded though. Yo, That's people people guys. snatch some. Yeah. Yo, nothing nowhere. Supporters are insane. Like in a good way, but like it's so cool. Like this, I like hop in the Reddit sometimes and like see like people like really about it. Like it's cool. So someone snatched them up. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, thankfully man. they did because I literally, hey. I mean, I probably would have, I obviously would have eventually heard of you, but I wouldn't have yeah. heard of you that early on. Yeah. So thankfully somebody re-uploaded that. Okay, so yeah, where man. were we? 2016. Okay. You're opening up for Suicide Boys and Pooh. <laughs> <laughs> what happens after that show? Are you like, oh, the underground's cool. I'm going to like fucking be more involved in this. Or like, what was the thought process after that show? Um fuck i don't know man it was just like i played the show um just i don't know i think like i i played it and like obviously it was a suicide boys and puya show you know what i mean it wasn't i don't think a lot of kids you know like suicide boys and puya make some fire music it's like but it's, essentially two different genres right yeah but i so i think like a lot of the the people who were there weren't necessarily there to listen to me on my with my guitar you know what right. i mean and that's fine you know what i mean um but i think i just went home like and i kind of was like well hmm like i wonder where i should play shows or if i should play shows or so there was a lot of like you know like questioning and, and like thinking about where to go and honestly i just did what i always do like i just started making more and more music in uh it was never like I linked up with this person or I linked up with that person. It was always just like I did. I was by myself and I put out music and I just kept putting out music. Like I never joined anything or like. Yeah, because I think that's the interesting part too is uh, I've been doing these interviews. This is the first podcast, but I've been doing interviews for the past 10 years. And essentially everyone's story is always like, yeah, you know, I was doing my own thing, building up my own thing. And then I linked with this guy and we went on tour or and then i linked with this guy and we put out a mixtape but you really you really have a very small circle of collaborators yeah yeah it's like i was i i when i first started i guess like i produced everything myself wrote it myself just like played guitar bass like whatever made the beast myself and like really i only really started branching out when like i met jv and uh we just met in soundcloud dms and okay, so who is jv for the people who don't know jv is a certified king <laughs> he's a certified bad boy um he uh yeah he's just like this dude that like we like messaged each other on soundcloud because it was like yo your stuff is sick he's like yo your stuff's sick too and then we were on some skype calls together um like skype calls or like 
video calls or just straight like up like voice phone calls? voice calls. Voice calls. We, we were in this like Skype chat with like a lot of people were in it. Oh, a lot okay, of, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, so like we were in that and uh but like me and Joey kind of gravitated towards each other and uh we just like send each other like old skate footage of of us skating and stuff or whatever and then we made like a song together and uh I just like wanted to like make beats with someone else other than just myself because like I don't think it's a good idea for me to I do everything by myself and like it'd be cool to like have someone to work with not so was it hard opening up to someone else because this music is such a personal thing you're talking about such personal stuff yeah was that like a difficult process to let someone into that world that you built up around you honestly like you would think so but i feel like me and joey like got together like me and jv got together and like we got along so easily uh so like it was like pretty organic and like natural like we kind of were on the same wavelength and like we just realized that we make like cool stuff together so he was i started collabing with with him and then like here and there i'd start collabing with other people like uh oil color was like this was before jv i started collabing with different producers and uh but yeah i don't think I've, i haven't really like done too many collabs yeah and you also work with someone by the name of lil west yeah how'd you meet That's him my boy how did i meet him same thing dude i think just like soundcloud slash twitter is just like i've always loved little west like i heard one of his songs like 2016 or something or like it's like the bando so icy or something like i forget what it was it was like his first song he ever made and i was like this kid's insane and like we met up a couple of times and and uh because he's from delaware and like we met up in new york city a couple of times and like just like made songs together and it was like I feel like it's always, like, super fun, and, like, we come up with cool stuff. Yeah. So, okay, so around 2016 is when you really, like, you know what? I'm just going to keep doing my own thing. I've done my own thing this long so far. It's yeah. working out. Let me just keep doing my own thing. Yeah. You eventually signed to Pete Wentz's record label? Is that yeah. right? Do I have yeah, the story yeah. right? How yeah. the fuck did that happen? <laughs> Dude, I don't even know. Um I think like among like 2016 was crazy because that record labels were always calling like and I went to meet with every record label so like, like literally major record labels major were calling record you. labels yeah and you're going in there with your manager and these are the first times that you're going into Dude. these record label buildings yeah it was an intense period of time like and you know like there's so much folklore and like there's so many things that you can say about record labels a lot of them are fucking true man and i mean like and a lot of them aren't you know what i mean but you know some of this stuff this stuff was sketchy and uh i remember going into some meetings and just coming out of them like more confused than when i went in like those early meetings did they ever try and compare you compare you to another artist were they ever like oh man you make music like this artist and we're looking for someone like that artist like was that yeah yeah i think i mean like you know a lot of them were very um hospitable and really kind and stuff but there were a couple meetings where i was just like whoa (laughs) like they'd be like you could tell that they wanted something from me um so they could like they just wanted what they could get out of me right it like wasn't like a equally collaborative yeah like agreement being pitched to you is more like just give us everything and we'll fucking handle it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it was a little, it was weird. Like I just felt weird for a long time. And like the whole thing is like, okay, like, well, why should I sign to a record label? And my justification was like, I'm running out of money. <laughs> I right. can only sell so many shirts. I don't want to have to do the nine to five again. I want to be a musician full time as my career. And like, it helps me as a person. I want to wake up and be happy about doing music. And like, what's the easiest way to do that? Okay, let's do that. But, you know, I found out really soon. It was like, it's not, it's not really a good thing. A lot of these record labels, but I thankfully, I met up with Pete. Like, so, yeah, so how that yeah, how yeah. the how that happened? Man, honestly, I don't even know. Okay, so I think my manager um I think my manager so there's this dude Johnny Minardi. Shout out Minardi, that's my big dog. Yo. 
Johnny Minardi, okay? And Johnny Minardi at the time was working for Equal Vision. And I think he heard my stuff. And uh, he sent it to Pete. And uh, I remember getting a text from my manager like, yo, like, I guess Pete Wentz likes your music. And this was like, no, dude, like, nothing's happened yet. Like, I've, This is what, 2016? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, she was like, Pete Wentz likes your music. And I was like, oh, I don't really believe it. You know what I mean? And then I swear, like, the day after, the morning after, she was like, yo, Pete's going to call you in, like, an hour or whatever, like a half hour or something. And I was just up in Vermont, just like, sweating <laughs> so i was just like pacing around because like dude like i really i had really high posters of, like pete in my bedroom growing yeah, up like, so, so like, i don't think we didn't exactly touch on it but growing up you were a fallout boy fan yeah dude like even like they like like just it, it was a soundtrack to like my middle school for sure you know what i mean um so it's so surreal that this guy who was on your wall not only has listened to your music, but he likes it. So you're yeah. in Vermont waiting on the call. Yeah. So I had literally like, I feel like it was like an hour or something. And like, she's like, he's going to call you. I was like, okay. I was just pacing around, just waiting. And then I got like a, 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 someone was calling my phone and like my heart was racing or whatever. And picked up, I was like, hello. He was like, hey, this is. He's like, is this Joe? I was like, yeah. He's like, this is Pete Wentz. And I was like, what up, Pete Wentz? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, it was, you know, we had a long conversation. And it turns out he actually, uh, he his family has a house in Vermont, too. Oh, so, wow. like, we were just talking for a while. And uh, I kept losing service on him because oh, I don't have service God. anywhere. I was, like, freaking out. Um, but, yeah, he's like, I really like your stuff, blah, blah, blah. We talked for a while. And. And then, like, you know, hung up, I kind of freaked out. And then a couple of days after, we started talking about, like, a whole, like, label thing. And I was, like, the way that we were talking about it was, like, it was just so organic. And, like, he was, like, he's got everything going on, you know what I mean? Like, he's got a successful band, and, like, he wasn't trying to get anything out of it. I think he, like, really believes in my music, so... So, who, so the name of his label is... DCD2. So, DCD2. Who were the other bands on so that So, they label? go way back. Uh, Decadence. Uh, they go way back. I mean, like, Panic at the Disco. Um, oh, shit, really? Fall Out Boy. They sound themselves. They're on oh, there. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. So, um, Gym Class Heroes D2. is Decadence. And that's... Is that under Fueled by Ramen, or is that a separate... No, it's separate. Okay, it's just yeah. completely separate. So yeah. they were just the shit back in, like, 2006. They fucking scooped everyone yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. So I think crazy. it's, like, they, they, they're all, that. like, homies, like, these De De Decadence and Fueled by Ramen and stuff. Mm. Like, it's all, like, similar dudes. Damn, and they're all, like, really good people. The fire roster, though. Dude, so yeah. you're, like, looking at this roster. Not only are you talking to Pete Wentz, but you're, like, oh, my God, Gym Class Heroes. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. You're just freaking out. Yeah. So... It was kind of like a no-brainer, like having like, thankfully I met with so many labels and stuff and it just felt like a good fit. And we did it with uh, Equal Vision too. It was like... So uh, were you already signed to Equal Vision? No. No, we just did like a... Oh, okay. We, we both went in on it and like... Hell yeah. Yeah, it was just like a really like, just a really cool thing. Like, and it got a lot of people heard Reaper, which came out under them. So... Yeah. It was sick. So Reaper was after releasing EPs. Reaper was the first full length debut studio project. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah. What was that process like? From you start off recording in your dorm room, you go back to your parents' basement, and now all of a sudden you're signed to Pete Wentz's label, and it's like you gotta fucking drop this album now. What was that process like? Um. It was a lot of pressure. I mean, like, it was it was pressure that I put on myself. Um, there was external pressure, like, but I think mostly, like, pressure I put on myself was, like, damn. Like, they, they trust me in, to put out, like, good music. And uh, it was just really absurd. And, and I met, and I flew out to L.A. I worked with, like, 15, started, like, trying out different producers, working with, like, 15 producers, and, like, eventually came to Eric Ron, who, uh, me and him just really clicked and uh 
I came out to LA for a couple months and, and recorded a lot of songs and at a real studio. Yeah, so um, Eric, who did he work with in the past? Honestly, I don't even know off the top of my head. <laughs> like I just knew that he's like he's like an amazing producer, right. you know what I mean? Like It's like the real deal, real studios. Yeah, cuz we made a song, we made like a song in a day uh and it was just like I was like I really really like this, you know what I mean? Um and uh yeah, it was a very interesting process to like write songs at a real studio, like not in a basement and like and hearing like the fullness for the first time, mm-hmm. like I always know what I could sound like, but hearing like a studio version of it is like, whoa, like this is kind of gnarly. But so Reaper took like six months because I, I, I did a lot of songs at the studio, but then I came back and did a lot of songs in the basement and I couldn't help oh, myself. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. That's so, so fucking sick. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, yeah, we actually recorded like a full album at the studio and then I was like, whoa. I kind of want to do some songs in the basement oh so I, yeah so there's still a lot of like unreleased songs and stuff from reaper and um it took a long process but i think it came out kind of tight so that took six months you yeah. release it it was received well by your fans but also yeah john not even gonna try and pronounce his last name from the caramonica caramonica <laughs> john caramonica from the new york times he all of a sudden decides to proclaim it as his number one album of 2017. So what, Sign to P. Wentz, your first project, New York Times number Dude, one album. Dude, you're right. This was all, this is all like in the same year. Yeah. yeah, it feels like you were kind of building up, building up, building up. And then 2017 was just the... Yeah. So what was that like? New York Times number one album. Does <laughs> <laughs> it still not feel real? No, man. I mean, like, at the end of the day, like, I just make music to help people. And, like, I'm successful in my own mind at doing so. So I'm successful. But it doesn't hurt to see that. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's... I just, like, dude, like, I think a lot of people who, like, listen to me and, like, know me. I mean, they don't really know me, but I think they can tell that, like, I don't have the most, like, self-confidence. Like, I'm very self-critical, I always like hate on my shit whenever I put it out. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a flexor, dude. So uh, at first I was just like, dude, like this guy's like way too cool to like like this shit, like really like this shit. Like I, but like the more I just was like kind of in denial about it. You know what I mean? And and then we ended up like talking, um, and then he ended up coming to Vermont to do like the whole piece on the New York Times, and we went camping together. We went to uh, to this island, this remote island on a Green River Reservoir in Vermont, and like just listened to Reaper and like sat by the campfire, and like it was a really cool, really cool weekend. And wow, I just kind of like I don't know. I think like after all of this, like this explosion, there was like even like after that happened and everything, like probably like a couple of days after, I just like went home and like just kind of like sat in my room and just like started crying like i just uh couldn't process it or like i like was going for so long you know what i mean and like it stuff finally was happening and like it's just more than you could ever process because people like have like kind of like dreams and stuff but you never like you think they might come true or whatever but when it finally does like you don't really know how to like handle it Hmm. so it was super grateful i was like a super amazing experience and i'm like really grateful for it so like it was overwhelming but like i think like the gratitude kind of like overcast that yeah so are you still living at home or what's the situation uh me so me and uh my guitarist who plays in my live band Bert like we're just like looking at some spots right now to live so together. you're still living in your parents house yep New York Times I'm sure they framed the article is it framed in the house somewhere uh yeah no I have like a stack of like seven and like right now on my desk like right next to them but uh I think my dad has it framed yeah actually jv framed it before i even framed oh, it so i just haven't gotten a frame JV. dude yeah jv is the cutest kid out and that's a fact he really is um yeah man i i have so many stacks of them and stuff and i just i'm waiting for the right frame 
yeah so still living at home though <laughs> yeah dude yeah it is funny like all this stuff happening and then like my mom's yelling at me like take out the trash yeah what? it's like i was did you not see i was in the new york times <laughs> New York Times. um hello i was just touring um, the world i don't gotta take out the trash so you put that record out critically acclaimed what's the process of you're are you you're still on pete wentz's label is there like a level up that you take after that or like how does that work i don't know man like yeah like i definitely saw like a huge increase in like youtube plays and like spotify plays it's like because so like more recently the fueled by ramen youtube page posted your music video yeah so was it like okay this i put out this record it was amazing that's like you're signed to fueled by ramen or what's like how does that whole process like what is that even yeah like i was like yeah i was like upstreamed into fuel by ramen and like because like that a lot of similar people there because like that I mean? must be crazy as well because growing yeah. up you probably listened to all of the fueled by ramen bands and now like you're on yeah. their youtube page <laughs> like yeah. dude there was the same youtube page that i used to watch yeah yeah they have like 10 million subscribers right yeah it's so fucking and crazy. they still have the original like videos from like 2007 and yeah. stuff like three pixels it's so fucking insane yeah. i like still watch those like paramore videos like i fucking love paramore dude i still watch those old videos so and i'm like oh now there's a nothing nowhere fucking video that's like suggested as the next play it's such yeah, a trend. man yeah and it's very weird like coming up using soundcloud as a platform and being able to like use that as a platform to like get me to like fuel by rom and it's like a funny roundabout way yeah it's yeah. unreal yeah so you put out reaper then you release another album really quickly yeah what was the thought process behind that yeah so really they just like i mean fuel by was kind of hyped and and they're like let's just put something else out and i was like let's do it and uh ended up just like writing and recording an album in two weeks holy shit uh ruiner was made in two weeks and uh was really like interested in the concept of like minimalism and like it's all like co-production like me and jv and then we have a little bit of falls on there too who did like a lot with corbin mm. and uh yeah dude just like cranked it out and just was like felt like putting something else out so where'd you record that one that was recorded like most of it was tracked in the same basement <laughs> so crazy and then we went to new york city and uh went to new york city and then went to like an engineer and like recorded at like sony studios like just with the engineer like shout out nolan and drew like yeah just like full creative control just like doing it yeah Insane. dude yeah. So, coming off the high of your first official release being so critically acclaimed, was there a lot of pressure to follow that up with something that was better, or you were just like, "This is I'm just gonna keep doing what I've always done since 2015." No. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, interview over. No. No. Um, I feel like, you know, uh, Ruiner was like. I just wanted to put something out, man. Like I, I, I wanted it to be a stream of consciousness and I really was interested in minimalism. Like Reaper took six months. Like I'm really interested in experimental and experimentalism and like trying new things and uh trying new songwriting techniques and I looked at Reaper, I was like, Okay, we got a polished studio thing. It's very big. There's very there's so much dynamics in it and there's like very squeaky clean. And I wanted to just see what it would be like in my mind to not overly analyze everything that I put out and just like put something minimalist out there and ruiner for that was me. And it was a stream of consciousness just coming out of me for like two weeks. And uh, it was an experiment, you know what I mean? To just like, don't overthink it. Fuck like what anyone else thinks. Just like put it out. Yeah. And like, I'm like gonna put something out this summer too like i, I just really? w- i just want to keep putting shit out but like is that a I'm full gonna, album is this like no. breaking news mascarilla first podcast episode no, of breaking def- news definitely not a full album next album that i do i'll definitely take my time mm. 
take take my sweet ass time with it. Because so like the good reviews with the first project, and then do you read the reviews of the second project and you're like, oh well, it's not matching up to what they were saying about the first project, or you're just like, I just I don't, did what I wanted to do. And I don't it. read my reviews unless like someone like sends it to me. You know what I mean? Like, cause I just like can't why would I like do that to myself? You know what I mean? Whether it's like good or bad, like sometimes like someone will send me this like dude, sick review, check it out. But like, I know the way that I am. I can't like actively seek that stuff out because like if it was bad, I just like bum myself out. And it's like whatever people can say, whatever they want about it. But like, I feel like a lot of people won't really admit that like people like shits on something that you really like put a lot of love into. It's like kind of a bummer. So like, I don't, I definitely don't look at reviews. Do you like you even search your on them on Twitter or anything like that, or you're just like I'm not even gonna go down. I this have road. I have before, and I was just like, that was a, that was a hellhole. It's like no, like people's like, it's all like really positive stuff. You know what I mean? Like, hey, nothing nowhere, sick. No. But like I don't know, I just prefer not to. I just like try to stay in my own headspace and like put stuff out. So. Yeah. So, outside of, you know, you're working on the project that you're going to release in the summer, what do you, like, what do you think is, like, the next step? You've kind of broken on to this next level. Like, where do you see it going from here? Yeah, I mean, like, like I said earlier, like, I feel like I've, the mission is being accomplished every day of just, like, connecting with others through music and, like, helping people and providing some sort of, like, sonic therapy or however you want to put it to others. And, uh... It's just about, like, cultivating relationships with, like, people and, like, inspiring other people. And I don't, like, I have everything I need, you know what I mean? Like, I do want to, like, build, like, a log cabin or something at some point. <laughs> and I want to get, like, a dog named Bear. Maybe get a bigger garden. Um, you know, I don't know, man. I feel like in terms of, like, music, the music goes, like, for this next album... Like I said, I'm going to really take my time and I have a lot of huge ideas for this one and uh, I'm excited for people to hear it. I already started like putting some like demos together and stuff. So I just always want to put out music because if I'm not putting out music, I just feel like shit. <laughs> because like even outside of fans connecting with your music itself, you also do a lot of charity work, right? Yeah, I mean, I definitely try my best to to donate and specifically one one nonprofit that I work with a lot is the uh, the TPL Trust for Public Land. Um, they just conserve and protect public land. Um, they kind of go against lobbying to like build commercial bullshit, and they provide like spaces for people to like hang out and like enjoy nature, especially in inner city areas. So um, you know, we a lot of the proceeds for my merch go to them and you know we take donations at shows and stuff so yeah yeah i don't know any other rapper um donating proceeds to public lands hell yeah i mean the way. would you even consider yourself a rapper is that like a bad thing for me to call you nah man i mean you could call me whatever you want you could call me joey slick oh god joey slick <laughs> that is bad <laughs> no man i don't i don't know i mean it is like I I call it experimental music because I don't want anything to sound the same. Like, I already know the next album probably won't even have any rap in it or something. You know what I mean? So, people are always going to, like, call you something. So, like, Like, just... Like, do you envision yourself kind of shifting away from the rap moving forward? I don't know. I don't ever want to, like, put a title on myself or, like, set expectations like that for myself, but... I definitely have been interested in like other sounds lately. You know what I mean? So, uh, I don't know. It is funny. Like sometimes when people say like this, you make emo rap, it's like, it sounds like kind of a novelty a little bit. Cause I've been making so many different types of music. I mean, like even my first song, don't mind me, like compared to like the second one, which was called, it is what it is. It's like, they sound nothing alike. So, because I don't think I even asked the question earlier on at the start of the interview, but when you started recording music, you know, being recording, nothing, nowhere music, what were your influences at the time doing that? Recording when it started, nothing, nowhere. Like what were you listening to at the time? Like what were you influenced by? I was listening to, uh, Elvis Depressedly a lot. 
um, listening to a lot of Spooky Black. Yeah, and you could totally tell at the beginning. It was, like, very into Spooky Black. Um, and then, like, the dude who, like, really took the guitar beats thing and did it really well it was, like, Grief and, like, Bones and Surrender Dorothy was, like, you know, like, they did it really well. Have you ever met Grief? No. Do you know anything about Grief? Um, I've heard things about him, but that's about it. Yeah. I've heard some things. I think I'll get killed if I talk yeah, about it. Yeah, we should just, you know, I it. said one wrong thing on Twitter. Some people were coming at me. That's all I'm going to say. You know, that's yeah, all I'm going to say. So, I mean, but growing up, like, were you into rap or? Yeah, like, I liked, like, Dipset, like, Cameron and, like, listening to, like, Mob Deep and, like, um got into Lil Wayne a little bit um I also really liked like jazz rap like a trap called quest and mm. de la soul stuff like that got into Waka Flocka some break squad stuff yeah so because always... I mean it seems like you were completely doing your own thing and to circle back and then all of a sudden it's like emo rap and it's like wait hold on a minute <laughs> you were already doing this way before and yeah. it sounds like you grew up listening to rap and you grew up yeah. listening to bands like gym class heroes and uh fallout boy yeah. so whether you you're just not like the emo rap label you're just not into it yeah no i don't know man i mean like like i said people can people can call it whatever they want you know what i mean and people have to call it something they can't right. just be like he makes what kind of music do you make? Just makes music, you know what I mean? Like because when like you meet somebody on a plane, or maybe this isn't a good, <laughs> this isn't a good hypo, uh, hypothetical for you because I feel like maybe you're not going to be the most social person on the plane. <laughs> but let's just say theoretically that you're going to talk to people on the plane that you're someone like to. forces me to talk. Like what yeah. kind of music do you make? No, well I mean it's like oh so like what do you do? Like what do you even tell people? Like I'm a musician. Yeah, just say, like I make music, and then they're like oh cool what kind of music and you're like <laughs> i'm like you ever hear the band creed <laughs> nah um i just say it's experimental music i say i like to make weird stuff here and there do a little little rock some rap some indie whatever yeah i think they're i say that and they're just like all right whatever kid yeah yeah because like who are some are like so you were listening to spooky black and you were listening to some bone stuff do you still keep up with like that specific scene at all? Like, are you still into these like SoundCloud rappers or underground rapper, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, yeah. I was I wouldn't say I was like ever like super like drenched in it and like mm -hmm. really really diving into it because I've always just loved like so many different genres and like subcultures of music. But yeah, like I totally still listen to Bones. Um, I totally still listen to, like, Corbin's last album was amazing. That was so um, good. You know, like, I'll, I'll go on SoundCloud and just, like, go down and, like, check out, like, my feed from time to time. But, like, yeah. Just spattered with fucking reposts and it's impossible to navigate. Yeah, yeah dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, SoundCloud might be dead. Yeah, man, it's an interesting time for SoundCloud. R.I.P. 2013, 2014. <laughs> SoundCloud. Yeah, that was, you know, the real underground. Let's just put it that way. Oh, no. That's that's a big statement. Oh, God. But anyway, I think I've circled around uh, so many different times in your life in so many different ways and kind of went back and forth a million times. I think, I mean, we've been going for like, it feels like it's an hour and a half. It's probably a little bit less, maybe an hour and 15. Jesus, man. What's wrong with us? I think it might be time to wrap this up. Let's do it, man. Well, dude, thank you so much. You're the first official guest on the Masquerilla podcast. Dude. This is this is also my first time on camera in quite some dude, time. We're, so we're going through it together. I was incredibly yeah. nervous. I was dude, taking my headphones too. on and off in the beginning because I could like hear myself, but it was yeah, like kind dude. of echoey. Shit, dude. And like, I didn't know what to do. Dude, well, I mean, like, this was a very fitting podcast you and i yeah we both like, kind of we're in the world now both uh revealed ourselves and I, so. I learned i think i kind of learned how to do a podcast like halfway through i think i kind of figured dude, it out it's beautiful and you got this dude that was crazy. so expensive to print by the way okay i got it from fedex i was like oh dude it's gonna be cheap it was fucking ridiculous dude you're you're just a king with a cool podcast now thank you so much well thank you for coming on thank you to the producer Alex Ferrara, a.k.a. Man Ramp. Search Man Ramp right now on YouTube. Man Ramp Thrasher. That's who's producing this episode right now. You're going to lose your mind when you see what I'm talking about. 